Dr. Edim Hanga is a member of South African National Committee on the Confidential Inquiry of Maternal Days. He also serves in the Federation for International Gynecology Obstetrics, a task team on prevention of unsafe abortion. Please welcome Dr. Eddie to the podium. Good morning. So I've got palpitations this morning. Um, I guess I need some sedative. For <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm privileged to be um, here today. I want to say thank you very much to University of Michigan for inviting me. And uh, thank you for sitting and be, be prepared to be the guinea pigs to be tortured as I talk over the next few minutes. Um, but I'm particularly thankful because uh, um, Ethiopia is one of those few places I have always wanted to be, to be in. I love Chachi, she sings, uh, but I haven't heard any of her music being played yet, so there must be other people who are, who are good uh, uh, musicians. Uh, but I also want to express uh, our condolences, uh, the tragedy that happened uh, here a few weeks ago, uh, the air crash, and I, I know many people were thinking, oh, you're getting to Ethiopian Airlines. You know, they just had a crash. And then I remind them <coughs> that every year uh, in my country, in South Africa, uh, we lose over 1,500 women because of pregnancy and its complications. 1,500, uh, but we don't say a thing. Um, I'm a privileged person as I'm standing here uh, because I think my journey has been um, phenomenal in the kind of opportunities, but also the privilege of serving. I grew up as uh, afraid of women um, having, having come out of uh, a very conservative Christian uh, background, uh, I thought women bite, um, and anyway, entrance into the vagina, there are some teeth there that are waiting. Uh, so I went through high school, I went through university, I looked at women, appreciated them from a distance, and indeed, I... Uh, uh, when I finished, I never thought I would be an obstetrician gynecologist, let alone being an abortion provider. Um, I was actually very anti-abortion. Remember when I got to medical school in 1972, um, this one lady who died, uh, she had uh, procured a back straight abortion, or unsafe abortion, and she, because she was carrying a pregnancy from a white man and she was black. And uh, in those days, it was forbidden for blacks and whites to be in love, uh, let alone being in bed together. So uh, I was quite, I said, well, it serves her right that uh, she, she died. Uh, what was she doing across the color line? That's where I come from. And it took the death of a colleague many years later, about 12 years later, uh, who had come in with a septic incomplete abortion. And she came to me about 12 midday. I was, in, I was a resident then. And, uh, she said, I'm not well. I examined her. Then I said, no, that's fine. Two o'clock, I'll meet you in theater. I'll put up the drapes and everything. One o'clock, I'm going to a meeting, but two o'clock, I'll be in theater. At half past one, somebody came through and said, you are needed in theater. She had collapsed. She was a professional nurse. 
we looked at her, found that the cervix was gangrenous, and we had to open her up, remove her uterus, remove the ovaries, and then we sent her to ICU, to the intensive care unit. Um, three hours later, her condition was not stable. We took her back to theater. We opened her up again, and we found that pus had spread retroperitoneally right up to the diaphragm. We had to scoop that pus. For 10 days late, uh, thereafter, each evening, I was at her bedside praying and saying, God, give her another chance. She died. The following week, there was a memorial service. I saw her mother sitting and her four-year-old boy. I said, there's no child who deserves to grow up without a mother. There's no mother who deserves to lose a daughter. And that's when I changed. Before then, I had been a traveling secretary of the Christian Medical Fellowship, visiting the medical schools, uh, trying to help the medical students uh, to deal with issues of contraception. What do you do when a 16-year-old comes to you and asks for uh, contraception? As a Christian doctor, what do you do? Do you send her away and say, I don't encourage promiscuity? Or do you say, well, here it is, but here are some of the effects associated with uh, premature sexual exposure. So that was my time before I got married. And then I got married. And I continued until this time. And then I started saying, no, the law is not, it's not okay. You see in the, in, the, in the slides, I'm talking like this so that uh, I don't want to be disturbed by the slides. Uh, because the law was accessible to white people. Because you needed to have four doctors who would say, yes, this woman deserves to have an abortion. But the four doctors cannot be working in the same institution on the same practice. And out in the rural areas, you only had three or four doctors for the whole hospital. So they couldn't gang up together and make a case for a woman to have an abortion. So many of them would come in and many died. Now, as I said, I was afraid of women. I wanted to be a surgeon. I didn't want to be a gynecologist. But when I saw the many women and children who were dying, I then said, Lord, well, if you placed me here to see this tragedy, I guess you are sending me. Because they said, well, we cannot accept you for just an extra year of experience in obstetrics, gynecology, and pediatrics. You have to undertake to specialize. I said, not me, spending the rest of my time just looking at that area, I'll fall into sin, you know, just after the first one. But then I said, okay. And, and that's how I then said, okay, fine, I'll specialize. And since then, I don't think I could have been in a better position, in a better satisfying uh, occupation than being an obstetrician gynecologist. They have come with challenges. Of course, it meant colleagues then called me and said, how can you support abortion and this kind of things? When you are a Christian, you know, you have been the president of the Student Christian Fellowship. You have been the president of the Nazarene Young People's uh, International. Uh, you, you, you have been the traveling secretary of the Christian Medical Fellowship. How do you, re how, how do you reconcile these two? But I found that at the end, it is all about love, that when I look at you and I look at myself, when I look at you, I see the image of God in you. But I know I'm not perfect. Therefore, I cannot judge anyone but to only serve and to show love. And that's my story. I'm glad I've got four wonderful women who are supporting me. Uh, uh, 
unfortunately, I don't know, unfortunately or fortunately, I've got no boy, but I can tell you those ladies are so supportive. Uh, I'm the happiest uh, father or husband they can ever be. I do fall along the way, you know, so on. Uh, like watching a lot of um, soccer, uh, but uh, they have come to reconcile with that. Now, may I ask here, it's personal. Now, if it is against religion or culture, uh, please forgive me. Are there any people who here who believe in female sterilization? Permanent method, female sterilization, anyone who believes that? Oh, the hands are very apologetic. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. I see it's less than 50%. Okay, right? Uh, anyone here who believes in male steril sterilization? Yeah, again, it's a, uh, there's, it, it, there's a patch somewhere here where the hands neither go up. <laughs> Okay, and, and many people actually get surprised when I say, I've had a vasectomy. At home, they say, what? So in church, they no longer invite me to talk on health matters because they know Eddie is going to talk about sterilization, male sterilization for that matter. <laughs> so taking away our power, you know. Um, but the issue of abortion and contraception has always been put on the lap, okay, the lap of women. Uh, we hardly involve men at all. We only address their, their, their concerns about the tablets that are making them impotent, okay, because of increased secretions and the wateriness and stuff like that and so on. But we never talk to them about their role that they should take uh, individual uh, responsibility. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that abortion and, and, uh, abortion and uh, contraception or family planning, they are two sides of the same coin. Now, we all know about sexual health, and um, we're all here because of sex, right? Yeah, we didn't drop up from somewhere, okay? And we're all sex workers, okay? Right? Either commercial or subsistence sex workers, okay? Some of us are married sub subsistence sex workers, okay? Uh-huh, okay? Uh, uh, others are commercial, but most of us here are commercial sex workers, okay? We earn a living out of sex, out of the proceeds of sex, okay? <laughs> contraception is all about sex. If you don't have sex, you don't need contraception, right? Okay, so we're all sex workers. But, but sex is a beautiful thing, okay? It's a beautiful thing. And uh, uh, ladies, I can only talk about males. We, the males, die a small death when we have sex, okay? You know, we get that eclamptic fit, you know, right at the end we have a fit. Uh-huh, and... Okay, and we talk in tongues, okay? I will call you uh, Stella when you are uh, Mary or whatever like that, okay? And we promise a lot of things that we forget about <laughs> after that fit. All right, okay. Everyone should have the, 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 the right to this enjoyment which is God-given, okay? All right. Whether you've got disability or no disability, whether you're tall or not short, okay? And that's what sexual health is all about. And that's what we're all about. Okay. And our role really, how do we prevent unwanted and unsafe pregnancy? Because sex has got consequences, okay? Yes, there's the enjoyment part of it, but there's also the other part of nine months later something may be happening and we, how to lower the maternal mortality. But one of the issues that we have faced all along is the issue that 
we make commitments. Various countries, we make commitments. We go and stand World, Med World Health Assembly and we stand up and say, yeah, we sign, we ratify this convention and so on. But we come back home and we think, uh-uh, that was just a show. Real life begins. Nothing happens back here. Uh, what are the reasons for the lack of uh, 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 progress? And also, the future challenges that we have uh, in terms of sexual and reproductive health. You see that I always put the sexual in there uh, because I've since discovered that sex is, is, is nice, okay. In the right time, right uh, uh, space. And then how we can, we can improve issues for, 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 for men and women. Now, in our countries, we lose a lot of women, especially in the developing countries. We know what to do to prevent unwanted and uh, unsafe pregnancies. We know how to manage high-risk pregnancies. Or if we don't know, we should know. Uh, one of the challenges is, do we act timelessly in preventing not only the mortalities, but the morbidities. Today, there are so many women who are the living dead because they have been destroyed inwardly. Uh, I know I was, I had the privilege just a few uh, years ago uh, when I came to visit to go to the, uh, river, uh, the hospital by the river, the Fistula Hospital. I had the opportunity of meeting Mrs. Hamley. Uh, and you look at those faces. You look at the patches on the floor. Your heart breaks. But we are able to prevent that. And family planning is about women and men accessing uh, sexual and reproductive health services that meet their needs. Now, family planning is an important component this I don't need to mention, I think we all, we all know. Uh, when contraception fails or is not possible, abortion is the last possible process to avoid uh, unwanted continuing pregnancy before viability. The two sides of the same coin. It's all about the same issue. So health workers need to support uh, both uh, services. Now, family planning is quite easy. But we seem not to want people to have access to that. Uh, it may be because people don't have the information or because somebody, uh, like some religious organizations, stand firm and instill the fear of God that should you touch that little pill, your future is no one can ever save you. So the FIGO initiative on preventing unsafe uh, pregnancy is all about making that it's all about making that commodity accessible and available. So it combined both the issue of contraception and abortion. You see my, uh, my slides tend to, to repeat themselves. It's technology. On the international front, we've got may, may, many conventions and things that we have signed. I'm not going through, uh, to go through them. Conventions on the right of the child, the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, um, international covenant on civil and political rights and convention against torture and other cruel, inhumane, degrading uh, treatment or punishment, and convention on the rights of people, of persons 
with disabilities. We have seen the Millennium Development Goals. We have seen we haven't achieved them. We can try and manipulate the figures to say maybe there's a little bit of improvement here, a little bit of improvement there. But in reality, is that the yardstick that we have used, we haven't made much change. We're hoping that with the sustainable development goals, we are going to, 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 to reach them. But you know, the big issue that we have failed to identify is if we say we have had improvements, what exactly did we do to have those improvements? Because politically, people will say now we are aiming at 75 uh, deaths per 100,000. That's the aim. But what had you done before? We don't know. And therefore, to then say we're going to aim for 75. Because we don't know what we did, we don't know what we need to do to get there. But one of the issues that we need to do is to put women first, but also to put the power of women and couples in their hands. Uh, Dr. Miriam Were, who was the uh, a leader in the UNFPA, uh, in um, Nairobi in 1990 said, if communities just had 50% or 20% of the knowledge that health workers have about health, they would be far better than they are today. But we tend to hold that information uh, deliberately or uh, unconsciously because we do not talk the language of the communities. When I addressed ministers of the Commonwealth, health ministers of the Commonwealth, uh, one of them asked me, but why are you speaking in such a simple language that we now can understand? Yet we've got obstetricians, gynecologists in our countries. They don't tell us about these things. So we have to also learn how to communicate in an understandable way. Medical people are the most difficult people to understand. Even when we're busy dancing, we're talking about the jugular on the vagus nerve and everything else like that. Um, and people who are not health are immediately excluded, not understanding what we're doing. HIV is still a major threat within countries, including South Africa. Political commitment, um, yes, we make promises, but we don't do anything. I talked about the sharing of info, uh, information. Patriarchy is still a major issue. We've gone on and had the Maputo Protocol, uh, but we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, done much according to that. So the FIGO initiative looks at primary prevention, which is prevention of uh, unwanted pregnancies, then it is about if the pregnancy also occurred, how to prevent, how to provide safe abortion, okay? Um, we have got simple tools, and then also how to manage the complications of unsafe uh, abortion, sepsis, your hemorrhage, your injury. Now, unfortunately, what often happens is that people who are opposed to abortion tend not to get the skills. And when they are forced to, because of an incomplete miscarriage and so on, then they do things the wrong way. I've had the situation where somebody kept on pulling uh, and saying, oh, I think these are intestines of the fetus cutting and putting them in a bucket. And then suddenly the, the curate was a little bit went beyond the limit, says, oh, I think I have uh, perforated the uterus, uh, referred the patient to a, a higher hospital, but kept the bucket there. The following morning, the cleaners in the theater uh, looked and said, well, what is this? 
and the nursing assistants as well. Those are things that the doctor was taking out of the uterus. And these were pieces of intestines of the woman that they were pulling and cutting, pulling and cutting, pulling and cutting, okay? Uh, because they said, no, we are religious. We do not want to learn the skills. But somebody had an intrauterine death uh, from severe hypertension. And this was the third pregnancy, and she had lost the previous two. Now she ended up with a colostomy uh, uh, and uh, no ability to, to be pregnant uh, ever again. Okay. So uh, those are some of the things that happen. Forms of, con of family planning, let's not, let's not uh, sideline those who say we go the natural route. Okay. Just we say, how best can you do that? Okay, they become allies. Often those who say natural family planning, you find that the, the men and the women uh, work together and saying, how do we prevent this? So let us uh, do that. Um, those of um, us who come from cultures where coitus interfemoris is, is, is also uh, um, practiced, uh, yes, let us do that, okay? Uh, let us support them, but tell them that uh, wait a minute, you need to do it in the proper way. Uh, otherwise, when you're about to have the fit, uh, you just go ahead and then uh, uh, the lock that was put in, suddenly it is unlocked uh, and uh, some of the fluid find their ways in. I've had quite a few number of uh, uh, pregnancies where the hymen was intact, okay? And people ask, but how did I fall uh, pregnant? Said, well, maybe you are married. Uh, that's um, uh, okay. You know Mary, okay? I think I see people. Okay, <laughs> uh, but 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 that happens. But again, if they do it properly, they don't lie uh, on their backs, but they lie on their side with their knees straightened. Okay, uh, there is no way uh, that that extension cord can get to the socket, you know, to connect. Okay, because sometimes that man looks for the socket and I can't get it, okay? Uh, because there might be people who are under 18, so that's why I'm using the terminology, okay? Barrier methods uh, are also useful. Of course, whatever method, let us always use the, the condom. Intrauterine and vaginal uh, contraceptive devices, are they, all these things are the, the combined oral contraceptive, the injectable uh, and subdermal implants, and as I talked about, the permanent uh, uh, methods. And I say to people for the vasectomy, I say, I still stand at attention because uh, people think that vasectomy is castration, okay? Uh, but it is our job to say to them, no, 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 you'll still be standing at attention and even for a longer time because now you are free of any fear of, uh, uh, of any mishap, okay? Amanda, there you go. Now, in South Africa, what had happened? A uh, little bit <clears throat> about that. There were mass removals. There were internal displacement. You were removed from one area to the other, took the men to the mines and to the urban areas to work. Uh, but then the, the policy of the country focused on population control. So um, even before the placenta is out, many times they would then be putting the, the injectable, uh, uh, you know, uh, a contraceptive, uh, lest by some chance you get pregnant again, even if your man is uh, 300 miles away. Okay. Uh, it was a dedicated program because it was about this controlling, this uncontrolled explosion of this black population. Okay. So that's why South Africa even today, over 70% of the contraceptives, or 70% of the women who are using contraceptives are using the injectable contraceptive, okay? So it's been so entrenched. There was a specific budget, a specific unit within the country that was looking after that. And you used to get very well paid if you were working uh, in that program, okay? And we also had intrauterine contraceptive devices, okay? So uh, we also had the permanent methods, and indeed there used to be a vehicle that would go from hospital to hospital. Monday it would be in this uh, hospital, Tuesday will be in that, and so on, and women would be lining up, and 
all be sterilizing, sterilizing. Uh, okay. And uh, some of you might know that we had had the doctor who was called Dr. Death, uh, Dr. Um, Voltaire Basson. Um, I, I was, uh, I don't, say, I don't say I was privileged to sit on the panel to try him, uh, but yes, I was on that panel and we found him guilty of violating human rights. But one of the things that they were researching with uh, on, together with the US uh, Army, uh, the, to how to sterilize permanently uh, the black population, okay? Uh, in addition to other other things like the toxins that would, they would provide in the in the in the um, the clothes, um, so there was that concentration on controlling uh, the, the, the population. Uh, they even had you know, reverends and uh, pastors who would go around, very good orators. They would engage communities and telling them on how how to prevent uh, unwanted pregnancy. So there was some good in it, but there also some bad. So it was prevention at all costs, and we used to sterilize women. If she has had two cesarean sections, the third cesarean section, uh, whether she likes it or not, it's now unsafe, we would just um, uh, sterilize, uh, sterilize you. Um, and, um, but we didn't care so much about how many people were actually dying from, from, from pregnancy and what they needed to save them. And we had the Abortion and Sterilization Act that I referred to. So after my getting into the um, res residency, I mean, after coming out as a specialist, uh, of course I'd been praying. I even got a prize for making recommendations that there need to be a reform of the Abortion Act. Lo and behold, 1994, there was the, um, the liberation, and so on. And uh, I got invited, why don't you apply for the job of director of maternal and child health for the country? I'm out from the bushes out there in, in the periphery. I said, no, okay. They said, if something can work in the bushes, I'm sure it can work nationally. So I got in. And two of my responsibilities were to make maternal deaths notifiable and to reform the abortion law. I said, Lord, wow. Now, I thought I'm just praying somebody else is going to do it. Now you have put me in to do it. So I was privileged then to be with that crisscrossing the country, engaging politicians and others. Uh, to get the current uh, um, uh, uh, act in place. We looked at expansion method mix and uh, promoting HIV, condoms, and, and then uh, devolving the uh, family planning to the provinces, uh, as well as the training. Uh, however, unfortunately, we took our eyes off the issue of human resource development, particularly around sexual and reproductive health. Yes, we had the choice on termination of Pregnancy Act. Indeed, we were notifying maternal deaths and we were inquiring into each death that was, uh, that was uh, there. But we took our eyes off. And this is why I want to applaud, indeed, the center uh, and the University of Michigan uh, to say human resources is very important. We may have all the other resources, the equipment, the drugs, and so on. But it is people who make the difference. And I hope that indeed today, as we all are sitting here, we are all going to be activists uh, who will be advocates for sexual uh, and reproductive uh, health. Okay. Okay. Now, we haven't made much progress because now, Health worker ignorance and misinformation is rife. Okay. Uh, the attitude to the special groups, to the young people, we still say, oh, no, no, you are 16, uh, you are 15, you are single, and so on. We cannot access this. 
But he sex didn't read the textbooks and what you call it, it comes naturally, okay? Uh, if you can control it, the urge, that's fine. Hallelujah to you. Uh, but there are those who, uh, yeah, they found the urge to be irresistible, okay? Uh, particularly uh, amongst us males. I don't know how God made the female, uh, but I can tell you, ladies, we look at you, the blood leaves the brain and goes to the groin, and suddenly uh, the brain becomes hypoxic, okay? And we, okay. But we have to learn. Bear with us. We will get there in learning to control ourselves. Um, we pay very little attention to counseling so that people know what to expect, that that is not a life-threatening issue, but we have heard yesterday and we know the issue about stigma. Unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the whole issue about power and uh, the issue of rape, uh, it's so soul-destroying. Uh, uh, I'm one of the few who would say, indeed, human rights or no human rights, any male who, who rapes a woman, uh, deserves to be reminded every day when he passes urine that he did something that was not right. In other words, we should probably remove those two uh, dependent uh, uh, you know, objects that are close to the penis, okay? Uh, because the woman herself is never the same. I do not care what kind of uh, psychotherapy you give every time she's exposed to a sexual event, she gets the flashbacks. Uh, it has destroyed her. In one thing. Unfortunately, we've got so much of this that are happening. Other issues is that in our country now, we also find that we have stockouts of some uh, uh, commodities uh, for family planning. Uh, because we don't think it is important. The issue about poverty, issue of being unable to go for, 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 for your repeat medications or repeat uh, uh, methods. Um, wrongful ad uh, administration and the client factors, uh, forgetfulness and so on. Uh, we, we lack an enabling uh, regulatory framework in most of our countries uh, we often say, you know, in our country, in South Africa, no, you cannot talk about condoms in schools. So they even said, you cannot even come within 50 meters uh, of the perimeter fence of a school. And that's a minister of education. On the other side, we say, but we need to protect the young people from HIV and unwanted pregnancies and so on. But we are a, we are a divided uh, country. You may have read that in the in the in the papers. But we will get there. Um, the belief systems and the issue about cost and sustained funding. Unfortunately, South Africa has now fallen into that space uh, where now, for everything else, for the army and so on, we will get money from our own resources. But when it comes to sexual and reproductive health, we go to funders, please, can you give us something so that our women do not die? As if you can have soldiers without women. You cannot grow soldiers in a refrigerator or an incubator. Women are the soul of a nation. If we do not take care of them, we cannot take care of ourselves. But this is what has happened. The world over, the budget for the army. No one goes to the World Bank to borrow money for the army. Not a single one. But will often go and beg. Something is not right with We also have displaced communities and 
we've got this religious and cultural indifference or intolerance of one another. But one of the issues that we are failing in is to communicate what happens if the method that is used fails. And that often speaks louder than everything else. That method that fails because the grapevine suddenly says that method is not working. Everyone, whether you're an imam or a pastor, a televangelist, you've got a role to play in contraceptive and safe abortion. You do not want dead believers. Dead believers are of no use. Okay. So imams and them and pastors need to say, well, if, if you have fallen into sin, it's not the end. No one is without sin. But there is safety. You can go and have that termination. But come back will help restart a new life. Community mobilization, we have forgotten about that. And unfortunately, this also affects HIV. We hardly talk about the communities anymore preventing HIV. Because we think that the tablets, the pills, are there to save us. But we cannot afford all the pills that are developed all the time. Talking about South Africa now, our medication budget currently for HIV is greater than the budget for all the other medications combined. We will run out of Antiretro, it will, will run out of hematinics, iron supplements for pregnant women. But we will have stocks and stocks of antiretroviral medications. Because somebody else is pushing another agenda. Now, of course, people have found creative uses of those ARVs now. Okay, So they mix them. And there are various drugs that are now used on the market, uh, called Nyaope or Wonga and so on. So some people who go to get their ARVs get robbed on their way back home. And uh, uh, people then, drug addicts then take those medications, crush them, mix them, and then, and then smoke them uh, uh, and, and, and get high on those, on those things. Okay. So uh, whilst trying to solve one problem, we have created, uh, created um, a, another. So we need to mobilize the community. We also need to involve the business people, workplace distribution of um, the contraceptive, something that we have talked about for so long, way back in the early 90s and so on. We talked about that. Up to today, in South Africa, we do not have this. And women often have to take a day off to go to a clinic in order to have access. And yet we're not even prepared to open our clinics on Saturdays and Sundays when people are back from work. So uh, this is a double burden now on the women who are working to put uh, food on the table. I uh, talked about talking to communities, journalism, the media, and so on. You go into South Africa today, you would be forgiven to believe that we've got no problem of maternal mortality of unwanted pregnancies. The only thing that will alert you are the billboards or the lamp post placards that are put in there. Safe, safe and quick and painless abortion. Penile enlargement, you know, and so on. People put on this post. So people phone these numbers and they get the tablets uh, on the black market and then use them uh, and many women still come in with complications. I talked about religious uh, uh, organizations. Um, implants. We, we had implants 
uh, that we, uh, way back 1995 because of our system that depends on nurses. South Africa decided then that no, uh, until we get the nurses authorized to insert and remove them, uh, then uh, uh, we, we cannot introduce them. However, last year or the year before, there was a big fanfare of the minister saying we are going to launch these implants without looking in the ground and saying what needs to be in place. So they launched that. Um, there was very limited counseling in terms of the side effects. Uh, bleeding and headaches, migraine were the common side effects. Uh, that, and the other issue was the uh, migration of the, of the implant. In one particular case uh, um, was the one where the, the implant uh, went on and ended up in the pulmonary artery and it needed cardiothoracic uh, uh, surgeons to remove that. Okay. Uh, but also we had pregnancies in the presence of implant uh, and uh, 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 one joke was that one of the senior officials who is not a health person but uh, responsible for, for, uh, for maternal and child health top level, says, no, no, the, 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 uh, this, this lady had the implant put in uh, after she was pregnant. But of course she had been pregnant. She, she had had the implant for more than a year. Uh, now, she's, uh, she's, now she's pregnant. Uh, no, that's the, that's the reason. Uh, maybe we have a few elephants that are getting pregnant uh, in, in South Africa. Okay. But the other thing was that the issue of scarring particularly, particularly amongst the Africans. Some Africans, not all. Uh, and you know, some Africans have got, uh, uh, are predisposed to having keloids and so on. The aggressive response to a foreign body. And uh, so those kind of things, uh, people then sustained quite a bit of, uh, of, uh, of scarring. They decided, no, no, we're not going to have it. Now, this is a lady who's lying on a couch uh, I met her. She was pregnant. Um, as we're talking, and said, okay, was this a planned pregnancy? And so on. A tear fell. And this is the tear that you can see on the, on the chest there. Um, she says, I have an implant. But I felt pregnant, and I did not want this pregnancy. And unfortunately, she had not had the information about access to uh, uh, termination of pregnancy. Um, it's been difficult to remove, and some have been told, no, you go to a private doctor, and at the private doctor, you need about $50 in order to have it removed. Now, these are poor people who did not have anything. Um, some have been so desperate that they have gone to friends, friend and asked, them to use a nail clipper uh, under no anesthetic to clip at the end of the implant in order to get that out because they didn't have the, the, the $50 to, 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 to remove it. So we had ultimately to call people together. Uh, yes, we called people who had problems, uh, but quite a few number of people came and we saw various complications because of the lack of training, uh, but also the manufacturer had been tasked by people at National to be the ones who are training people to insert this, bypassing the statutory council within the country. Uh, talk about state capture. Uh, and then, of course, nurses were then afraid of disciplinary action by the nursing council, as well as litigation in case of complications. Uh, so the lessons learned was that, indeed, we need to know the community and practices, access the capacity uh, of supporting systems, and engage people, your partners, and assess what is possible. A good method became a bad method. Uh, I talked about the scarring, keloid formation. Now, that is one where you find that Actually, they tried to remove, uh, even though they removed it well, even the suture that they had put in, 
uh, started forming a keloid. Uh, now, when people see this, people say, uh-uh, this is very uh, unsightly. You can see uh, this one, the insertion point is down here, but it had migrated more than three uh, centimeters up. So the issue of migration was also a concern. This particular lady, she's lying down, this is the axilla. Now this is where now the uh, implanton was now palpated, uh, uh, no longer further down, uh, uh, down here. Uh. So counseling again is important. Issues of um, abortion, the issue of stigma, political and community leaders need to be, we need to be sustained. Unfortunately in South Africa, we had the law but now we have a minister who says, I don't believe in women's rights. Uh, there's this religious and cultural inferences to abortion. Uh, I was called by colleagues who came and said, how do you do this? So doctors called me on a Sunday afternoon and said, we want to find out why you have backslidden. Fortunately, there was a lady who was a social worker who was from a conservative church. Uh, she had been asked also to come. And when she came, she said, please, can I talk first before the others, uh, before uh, Dr. Mshanga comes in? They said, no, fine. So she then said to them, these were about 15 or so uh, African Christian doctors, all in private practice. So she said to them, I know you are upset about this act, but let me ask you, how many of you have adopted children? Because for every, fifth, for every 40 African children who are there for adoption, only one African couple is prepared to adopt. But for every 40 white couples who want to adopt, there's only one child who's available to adopt. You cannot tell me that you cannot afford it materially. Now, if you cannot do that, why do you blame the government for then introducing this act for termination of pregnancy? She got up and she left. And the, chair, the, the, the program director then got up and said, no, we want to apologize now uh, to you, Eddie, because we had called you here to find out why you have backslidden. But now after that talk, we just want to apologize. And uh, we are supportive. We indeed will be supportive of that, uh, of, that, of that program. Then I said, thank you, Lord, because I didn't know what to say, but you put the words in someone else. But these are the challenges that we, we, we meet and we need to keep on challenging and saying if a woman comes in, a couple comes in and say we cannot afford another pregnancy, if we cannot materially assist, we have got no role to say, no, you cannot go the route that you have chosen. Okay. There's also a delay in seeking help, not only in terms of for induced abortion, but also the ones that are spontaneous abortion. Because again in abortion, there is the stigma of saying, uh-uh, you are telling us it's spontaneous, but you actually must have induced it, okay? So we see those complications. People coming in when they think what they had hoped for, which was no complication, now actually they're having complications, and that's why they come into hospital. I will not forget the one case of a young lady. She was a refugee. She had run away with her mother from Mozambique, and she came in. She had been pregnant, and she had a, a, a miscarriage, an abortion, spontaneous abortion. And then she came into the hospital. Of course, it's assumed. She's 16 years old, 17 years old. She's pregnant. She must have induced this pregnancy. Anyway, what was she doing uh, getting pregnant at such an age? Two days after she was admitted, uh, I went and sat by her bedside. I put my arm around her shoulder and said, how are you doing, my dear, today? She broke down and cried. 
And she said, since you arrived, since I arrived in the hospital, you are the only one who has actually come and touched me. I had wanted this pregnancy so much. Issue of stigma. Um, of course, abortion is seen as the biggest sin. Uh, greater than waging a war against innocent civilians. World War I, World War II, whatever war you can think of. Um, but we don't talk about them. It's about that woman who comes in and wants to terminate her pregnancies. I would not get into uh, this. I'm talking to colleagues who know about spontaneous and uh, threatened and induced abortion. Okay. And what I want to do, and I think that the center um, uh, is doing that, really the trained care, trained health care provider. But what we often do not train people in is to be compassionate. When you look at somebody with love and understanding and compassion, there's no place for condemnation and judgment. Hygienic and surgically clean environment, appropriate equipment and technology, timeless intervention. So unfortunately, in the unsafe abortion in our country, people have now got so used to get the uncomplicated uh, uh, abortions that they don't know how to handle the ones in, uh, uh, that are complicated. Uh, we also do not talk about family planning, but family planning is an integral part of that counseling and the services and the follow-up and so on. Um, we, we have had a revolution. The manual vacuum aspiration, the prostate landing, the misoprostol, the methipristol. In our country, termination of pregnancy uh, is uh, permitted up to um, 20 weeks. Um, we have had partners who have assisted us, IPAS and others, doctors, uh, you know, global doctors for choice. We've been training doctors, but we've been training nurses. My greatest joy is really to be train, training those nurses and seeing doctors now actually referring cases to those, uh, to those uh, nurses. Um, I mentioned dilatation and evacuation, uh, mentioning it basically and saying, uh, in our environment, we find that to be uh, dangerous, uh, given the skills that people uh, have had. Uh, so we, we, we tend to use mifepristone and misoprostol, even up to, uh, up to uh, uh, 20 weeks. And using those in combination actually allows us not to hospitalize people. Uh, we can give them mifepristone and they go away, and then they come in. Uh, two days later at 8 in the morning and then they're given the mesoprostol and then within three hours, most of them, about 80% of them will deliver within those three hours. But if they don't, then we give them incremental doses, uh, 400 micrograms of uh, uh, mesoprostol every two hours for maximum of two do three doses and they will, they will deliver. That has also helped in us not having to, for instance, at about 18, 20 weeks to think, somebody who has had a previous cesarean section to actually think maybe we need to do a hysterotomy or kind of thing like that, but we are able to, to use this combination, okay? Analgesia and anesthesia, uh, most of them, basically engagement and empathy. Uh, verbal, what they call verbicane, okay, talking to a person, uh, talking to a colleague yesterday who was uh, in engineering, and she was saying, hey, but what about the pain? But when you've got that empathy and somebody holding your hand, uh, you, 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 you need uh, very little, but you can give regular analgesia, paracetamol, uh, injectable or oral, other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs about half an hour before. Uh, you can also do paracervical uh, blocks. Um, um, can give... Uh, particularly for the very young one, morphine, sulfate tablets, and then general anesthesia. Who performs it? I said mid-level workers, uh, mostly, doctors mostly for the complicated cases. 
uh, and then the informal ones who are dishing out the tablets out there in the taxi rank and so on. But in actual fact, as soon as the woman starts bleeding, they say, you go to the hospital. And indeed, once she starts bleeding, uh, then she gets regarded as an incomplete or inevitable uh, miscarriage. Okay. Um, we've seen these who are done outside the health system uh, actually contributing a lot to uh, uh, maternal mortality. Now, our challenge is the issue of HIV, because HIV can modulate how a person prevent, presents. They may come with no fever, but they are already septic, okay? But normally, we will see those, uh, those signs. I will not get into them, but the major issues is that once they come in, we need to treat them as emergencies, and no one should leave their bedside until we have made a plan and actually removed the uh, offending uh, issues. Um, the factors that we have a problem with, refusal of professionals to perform TOP, politicians and donors who are indifferent to sexual and reproductive health, I will not mention names, uh, and then the lack of information where TOP is accessible and uh, family planning is no longer prioritized. Um, as I said, misoprostol and methipristone has been the revolution. The use of mid-level providers and the medical eligibility criteria by the WHO and the reform of laws, these are things that have uh, uh, helped. The GEG rule, <laughs> okay, I will not mention much, yeah. In violence against women in displaced communities and in wars, okay, again there I won't say much because we seem to love war, but the greatest casualties of any war are women and children. Okay, the other challenge is anti-family planning, anti-abortion. Burn out. Unless we support the providers, we lose them because no one is there to support them. But also political indifference, and then we also need to continue doing research and practice what is evidence-based, and then engaging other people. Okay. Uh, that is the, the picture I showed earlier. She was sitting up, so I took that picture. Uh, With the current level of knowledge and technology, let not another tear fall. Let not another woman be silenced. We can stop the tears and the deaths. And we can stop the scurry and the graves. We cannot allow this war that is waged against women to continue. Only when we ask the right questions, find the answers and communicate this to the decision and policy makers, shall we make a difference? Now, I've paraphrased this last one from Professor uh, Patala. It says, women do not die or suffer indignity because of a lack of knowledge from the health providers. It is because we, as part of society, have yet to decide that women's lives are worth protecting or worth saving. It is upon us. Let us go out there and be the activists and be the fighters for justice because women's rights are human rights and human rights are no rights if women do not have their rights. Thank you.